Well, guys, Amen. thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I, I say Uncle Ray because personally I know him on a, on a different level, but seriously, he did complete his doctorate. So he is a rather Dr. Ray Siervo. And um, it's such an honor to have him uh, speak about the topics of discussion that we're going to look at today. Uh, Uncle Ray's got a website called nopatanswers.com. Uh, please check it out because there's a ton of resources uh, and a lot of things that is going on on the page, which is quite exciting. Uh, and it's in, in, incredible to see uh, the amount of things that he's busy with and the amount of things that he is still doing. Uh, Dr. Ray, it's good to have you. Wonderful to have you speak about the topic of discussion. Uh, we've mentioned in the past that from all spheres of influence, there seems to be quite an attack these days uh, from Islam, uh, especially from secular philosophy, and also uh, from, uh, if we can say, uh, almost British um, uh, agnosticism and atheism, that the crucifixion in itself is not truly historical, and the eyewitness testimony concerning Jesus Christ and the biblical text is just not kosher, or, or not to be deemed to be um, historical. So, uh, uh, for, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ray. Thanks again. All over Great. to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rudolph, for for this. Is it um, it okay? I call you Rudolph. We don't know if you're Professor Boshoff or. But um, I want to be proper. As you know, in the Western world, at one time, the Bible was at least honored or revered as a holy book. Not everybody believed it was the, the word of God, but at least people recognized it as something that was, was honorable. But somewhere in the 80s and 90s, we began to lose ground with that, and now the Bible is just relegated to, at best, one of several books that can talk about God. If not, it's just a myth, and so on. So in the mid-90s, I began to look for reasons for faith because of um, some circumstances that happened. I called it a perfect storm. God used several things to draw me into this subject called apologetics. Some of you will probably be more interested in this subject than not. Um, some of you will not see a need for it. You, th you would think that uh, perhaps um, just preaching the word is enough and that, you know, those who get saved get saved and those who don't, don't. I believe that we can engage the skeptic and we can use both the scripture and the natural order to share that God exists and use the scripture particularly to show that Jesus is alive from the dead, that the best evidence points to a resurrection. And when we find people who are intellectually honest and will consider the evidence, they'll at least acknowledge it, whether or not they commit their life to it or not, uh, is another story. I think that God is the one who saves people. I believe it's the Holy Spirit who works in people's lives to save people. Um, we don't save people, but nothing but God saves people. Prophecy doesn't save people. Not even love saves people. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. And we're just the instruments. So the question today is, what instrument do you use to share the gospel? Uh, 20 years ago, it was a different kind of um, mode or method that we could use. Certainly, there were great men like Billy Graham and other uh, well-known evangelists who had the power of the Spirit to convict people. But <clears throat> I'm not one of those people. I'm not even, I wouldn't even consider myself an evangelist. But what I want to do is I want to train people, equip people to str by strengthening their faith and their witness by understanding the reasons for their faith. Um, your commitment to the Lord and your submission to the Holy Spirit would be an important thing for you to obviously spend time to consider. That never gets old, that never gets worn out. 
That's something that you take the rest of your life. All ministry is responding to the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm just of the person you can see behind me. One of my bookshelves, I did um, a master's degree in apologetics. I graduated seminary uh, in 19, sorry, 2002. Went back to seminary in the year 2000. Um, went to my first Bible college in 1972 and um, went, got a degree. It was an, un, um, what would you say, it was not an academic degree, it was not a recognized degree uh, in biblical studies. I studied Greek and all the theologies that were necessary, but it still didn't have any accreditation. Um, so it needed needed to get beefed up some, but I don't think it lasted long enough to do that. Anyway, I went back to college, seminary, when I was 52. I had studied apologetics for several years and came to the place where I thought this is not working for me. So I needed some systematic teaching, went back to, went back to seminary at the age of 52, moved my family to North Carolina, and we went on from there. Now I said I wasn't going to take too much time to do this. But I, I want to focus on the New Testament because if there is a place that I resonate with, it's, and I think it's my church background, also my love for history. So um, let me just put a few books in front of you that, are, that I would say are, are necessary. I hope this reads the right way. This is Reading the Gospel Wisely by Jonathan Pennington. Uh, he's a, a student of Richard Balkum, who I will also mention. I have Balkum's book um, behind me. But if, if there were one book that I would recommend that I, I, I think would be easy to read, it's Can We Trust the Gospels by Peter Williams. I'll get my fingers out of his word, name there. Peter Williams. Um, Peter Williams is uh, from the UK. Excellent book. He takes much of what has been written recently on the resurrection and puts it together. And so it all depends on, on, on one thing, is that credibility of the New Testament writers, especially the Gospels. And we could advance the next slide. Um, what are the Gospels? And the Gospels are a particular genre. And if you're not familiar with the genre, just think of music. You have a classical genre, you have a rock, genre, you have a rap genre, um, country western genre here in the United States, you have classic rock, and so on. Those, so they separate, music is the topic, the genre tells you something specific. When we look at the Gospels, we're thinking of literature. So what kind of literature are the Gospels? In the Bible, we have several different kinds of literature. We have uh, poetry, we have prophecy or apocalyptic literature, uh, and we have historical literature, and then we have the Gospels. And while the Gospels definitely are historical, in, in the Greco-Roman times particularly, uh, they are of a particular um, genre, and they are a biography but not the way that we think of biographies today. And in um, the first century, if you were to, to read um, a biography from, say, a man called Plutarch, who was a Greek um, writer, uh, he, would have, he would write biographies. And here's the thing about history, especially when we think of biographies. Uh, history is written to make sure we understand an event that affected the world, for good or bad. Uh, but it, it made it, it impacted the world, made an impact on the world. That's why people write history. Uh, in the first century, people wrote biographies, even leading up to the first century, people wrote biographies 
um, singling out individuals and most of the time comparing them to other individuals. So you would have like um, the 12 Caesars and basically they would be comparisons between each of the Caesars. Uh, but when it comes to the Gospels, they are of a particular um, bioi is the Greek word. They're, they're of a particular um, biography concerning Jesus because you have historical things concerning Jesus as well as you're pointing to his deity. You're pointing to his mission. And I'm of the persuasion that you cannot understand the Gospels unless you understand the big picture of the Bible. And uh, could you advance to the photo of the arch? I, I want to just single out something in this archway that we look at. Um, if I'm looking to my side, it's because I'm looking at another screen that has, you know, archways are, are very, very unique uh, structures. And uh, they, they date back thousands of years when people discovered you could do that. And the archway depends on one stone. In other words, you're just looking at a bunch of stones that are stacked one on top of the other, and they are held together by what's called a keystone. And that keystone is right at the center of the top of the arch. If you took that keystone out, the rest of the stones would fall apart. The archway would fall apart. It wouldn't do that. So think of it this way, that that archway is symbolic of the scripture. And what holds the scripture together are the gospels. So when we look at all of the different um, genres of scripture, like poetry, making up perhaps 30% of what is in the, in the Bible, we recognize um, the, the prophetic aspect, the historical or narrative aspect of the Bible, all of those genres but they are all held together, they would make little sense without the Gospels. If we didn't have the Gospels, the rest of the Bible would just leave us wanting. It would leave us without really any understanding of why this compilation of books are, are put together. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Bible Project. It's a group of young people who, one of them is is a biblical scholar, Tim Mackey. Uh, they do videos and podcasts, blogs, all that. Uh, excellent, excellent source to look at. They do a lot of, they do a video of every book of the Bible. But they they recognize that the Bible is a unified story that leads us to Jesus. And so the way that I use this archway when I teach anything, usually this is one of the first things I teach about, is that that archway leads you to Jesus. So <clears throat> think of the, the what I've thought, what I've said already. At the pinnacle or at the, the center of the top of the archway are the gospels, and the rest of it is all the books but you go through that archway and what you find is Jesus. So it's a unified story that leads us to Jesus. Uh, if I were to try to explain the Bible story to a child, I believe that everything from a child up to an adult can understand this and memorize this. It's very simple. God made it, we broke it, Jesus fixed it. And if you were to look at um, all of the Bible, basically that is the story of the Bible. God made it, he created everything. In that he created men in, in fellowship with him. And you'll remember this in our next session. When God breathed into man, that he formed from the, from the, from the dust of the ground, from the earth. When he formed man, he breathed into man and man became a living soul. It was that action that created man, and he created man for one purpose, and that was to fellowship with God. And to, to test that fellowship and whether um, man could walk in that fellowship, because man, God gave humans 
something that he didn't give anything else on the planet other than maybe the unseen realm. He gave mankind a free will, a choice, and freedom in will means that you can choose other. And so what, what God chose, what man chose, was to disobey. He believed the serpent. We know man fell. So God made it. We broke it. And through the whole Bible, God is promising one thing, that he's going to restore his original intention. He's going to restore what God intended from the beginning. That is fellowship with him and mankind. And you see that at the end of the book of Revelation. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. So you see this whole story that leads us there. So what we see today is an attack on specifically on the eyewitnesses. You know, you've heard arguments against the New Testament that it's been copied so many times by so many different people over a long period of time. So there has to be errors in the Bible. Or the second argument would be uh, that there are many contradictions in the Bible. And uh, th those are some of the arguments you get from people who've not heard or listened to any of the arguments for credibility or um, reliability of the translation or the transformation, if I could say the transmission, I'm sorry, that's the word I'm looking for, the transmission of the, of the documents. Uh, I studied with a man who is called uh, Norman Geisler. He is uh, by far one of the best known apologists in the 20th century. Uh, Dr. Geisler passed away, I think it'll be two years now in, in August. He was uh, 80, 87 years old. And uh, I had the privilege of studying with him. He was the president of the seminary that I went to at that time. And uh, he he was, uh, you know, spoken, I don't know how many countries, every state in the United States, very well-known man. And and Dr. Geisler would, would always use the argument that we have the most manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, um, <clears throat> most reliable manuscripts, internally cohesive in that sense, that... Um, one, one of the things that we, we do as apologists is to defend what we believe is true, but we also make other people defend what they say is true. It's not my job to prove them wrong. It's their job to prove that what they're saying corresponds to reality, and that it is real, that there is evidence for what they're saying. So when, when we recognize the the attacks today on the New Testament, they've become a little bit more sophisticated, but let me just say this up front. What we have is an embarrassment of riches. Uh, one of my dilemmas in um, responding to this gracious invitation to do these two sessions is that I can't cover everything I'd like to in two sessions. I, I think it would take more like 10, maybe 15 sessions uh, just on on the resurrection uh, because there is so much evidence for, for the resurrection that Jesus was raised from the dead um, and looking at, at the evidence that is there. So there, there is so much for us to, to do that. But if I can go back to the arch before I leave, I leave it in... Um, go into something else. The Bible is constructed by God, and unless we understand the story of what God intended uh, in Genesis 1 through 3, and understand that what God intended was interrupted, if I could say that, that's a mild word. We call it the fall of mankind, that that. Eve was tempted, Adam disobeyed, and mankind was separated from God, and you have the, the, the um, angelic being standing at the, at the gate of the garden, not letting man back in and not letting, letting 
man back into Eden, that place where he fellowship with God. And then you just see how the story unfolds through the whole Bible where man just continually falls, continually fails, but God continually promises that one day someone is going to come and that person that would come would be his son, Jesus. And that's where we enter into the Gospels. So um, one of the things that, that Pennington talks about in his book that I think is a great illustration, um, I'm not sure, I've, I've not heard uh, my visits to South Africa anything about um, horse racing. Um, I'm sure you have some great horses here. But in the U.S., we, we have a whole season of horse racing that that begins early on in the year and ends up with um, three races. Uh, the Belmont Stakes is the last one. The Kentucky Derby is the middle one. And that's usually the most famous one. And the Preakness is the one before that. Anyway, let me just say this, that when you see a horse race, when you're standing there and you're watching, you know, the the, the gates open, the horses take off, and they're running. Uh, jockeys have been trained, had a position and everything. But nobody knows, really, even though there are favorites, no one knows who's going to win that race. And it's not until one of the horses crosses the finish line, sometimes just by a nose, wins the race. Well, it's in the rerun now through technology and videos that the announcer who called this race and called the horses as they were getting into position and what the jockeys were doing and whether they moved to the rail or they moved to the outside, whether they came from behind. He had to see all of that while it was happening, still not knowing what's going to happen. Now he's in the position. He knows who's going to win. So from the beginning of the, the rerun now, he knows how this thing is going to take place, and he knows how it's going to come across the finish line. That's how the Gospels are written. They're not written as things are unfolding. They're written from the end. They know what's going to happen. They know Jesus is going to be raised. And so they also know, from their perspective, each one of them has a, has a slightly different perspective, certainly among the synoptics, of what things are important to point out that get us to the end. And it's understanding that is very important for us to know that why they have different um, views of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. A friend of mine has a ministry called Cold Case Christianity, Dr. Jim Wallace, I'm sorry, Officer, uh, Detective Jim Wallace. Jim doesn't uh, have a doctorate, but he does have a master's degree in theology and some other things. But Jim uses forensics to study the study the Gospels. And one of the things he learned and brings to the table as a detective is that when you're called to a crime scene that has eyewitnesses, you want to make sure that the first people on the scene keep the eyewitnesses apart because if you put them together, they're going to get their stories pretty much lined up with each other. They're going to mention things that maybe the other person saw but didn't remember or didn't think it was important, and, and they will coalesce. They'll put that, that story together. So one of the things that, that Jim talks about with eyewitnesses is that you want to keep them separate from one another. You want to keep them really apart from one another. So when, when we look at the eyewitnesses, you can move to the next screen now. When we look at the eyewitnesses, we would like to, we would, we would interview them about certain things that are are unique to their perspective because they're each going to bring something different. There are no contradictions in the, in the um, biblical accounts, the gospel accounts. There are differences from an eyewitness account. Uh, Matthew says there were two angels at the tomb. Mark may say there's one, or Luke may, may say there was one angel at the tomb. 
Um, for all we know, there were two um, that Matthew reported. Let me throw this out there. There may have been more, but it was two that Matthew recalls being told to him um, by the by the women or the first people who got to the tomb. Now that that may sound like I'm I'm scandalizing things, but. How many angels have you seen? And if you did see an angel, what else do you remember about seeing that angel? I think it would be hard for you to recall very much else. Um, my, my explanation, I believe that it was one angel who spoke. And um, there were different, different scenes of the resurrection morning of when, when people went to the tomb, entered the tomb, saw the stone rolled away. There's, there's all different things to put together. So we, we recognize that. Um, and uh, that may or may not just lead us to some questions. I see my time is going. Um, we have about maybe 15 minutes for this session. Okay, so if what would we expect from eyewitnesses? Uh, we would expect them to know first century Judaism very well. If they were if they were there. Now, I'm not of the I'm not bent on when the the writers wrote their their um, records of the life of Jesus. Um, in other words, I think they were early, but I uh, I also think there were there were what we call living memory or oral history different from oral tradition. And um, during the break, I'll get the, get the scripture verse for you. It's in Acts chapter 13, where um, the apostle Paul is with Barnabas. They're preaching the gospel. And Barnabas, I'm sorry, Paul comes forth and he quotes something that ought to strike us. He mentions that John the Baptist um, said about Jesus that he was unworthy to untie the thong of his sandal. Now that, the reason why that ought to get our attention is that Paul nor Barnabas were present, at least not that we know of, when John the Baptist would have said that. So where would they have gotten that from? Paul is saying this or preaching this probably 10 years, 10 to 12, 13 years after the resurrection. Um, where, where is, where is Paul getting that from? Well, there had to be an oral history of the things that happened from the beginning of John the Baptist through the life of Jesus to his death. So, uh, Craig Keener, who's written on, uh, excellent commentary on the gospel of John, even a background commentary on it. Gospel of John. He's actually written the New Testament background, which is an excellent resource to get hold of. He <clears throat> last year published a four-volume book on the book of Acts. Um, but Craig Keener calls it living memory. So in other words, while the person who witnessed it is alive, he's able to keep the right memory of it true or correct. Um, Richard Bauckham calls that oral history at, uh, in, to differentiate from oral tradition. Um, oral history is there while the person who witnessed the event is alive. Craig Keener calls that living memory. And they get that from, I, I believe it's a man called um, Papias who writes at the end of the first century and beginning of the second century. And he would rather talk to someone who's, who witnessed the events. And what we know about history, or certainly from the first century, is that the most reliable sources were those who were closest to the events. So we have people who are writing in the first century recording in the first century, something from oral history or living memory. So I mentioned Paul's use of the phrase that 
John uses, I think it's in all four of the Gospels that it's used, that John the Baptist said this. And that was because of the reverence that uh, John held, John the Baptist held. He was, he was considered the first prophet since the return to the land, uh, since those uh, first, first people came back from Babylon to rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. It was, there was 400 years of silence until John the Baptist showed up. So he, he held this great place of reverence among the Jewish community. And so the things that he said are, are important to us. They, they tell us something about it. They tell us something about Jesus coming and baptizing people in, in the Holy Spirit with fire, uh, that he was going to be the baptizer. He was bringing in something new that wasn't there before. So John holds this thing. So my point is this, where does Paul and Barnabas get this from? If there wasn't already um, what was being spoken or being taught in the churches, and we'll look at we'll we'll look at something there a little bit further down the road. So, what would they know? They would know the political conditions. They would know the Roman authorities. They would know the Jewish authorities. Um, they would know the Jewish rulers, the condition of the Jews, the Greco-Roman world. They would also know things like the geography. You know that the four Gospels mention 26 towns, villages, or cities in Palestine, if we can call it that today, that they could not have gotten that information from Roman or Greek authorities, not even from Jewish writings at the time. So they mention towns that... Um, that other writers wouldn't, unless you knew that they were there, unless you were part of the situation or part of the scene, you wouldn't know those things were even there. This is what distinguishes the Gospels from what we what we might call the later Gospels or the Gnostic Gospels that are written in the second century, in the latter half of the second century. They have no knowledge of Jewish custom. Uh, they don't even know the names, which is one of the things that we'll cover in a little bit. But you could go through Luke's gospel and John's gospel and find over 80, 80 particular names of people, authority, and places just in those two gospels that um, have to be that have to come from my witnesses. Now I'll mention this: that it's Matthew and John that we can directly ascribe disciple being disciples of Jesus. Mark is known to be Peter's secretary or Peter's translator, if you will, as Peter goes um, to Jerusalem, I'm sorry, to Rome and, and travels through the rest of the world. Mark becomes his uh, secretary. And Mark, we could find Mark mentioned in, in several of the New Testament passages. Luke, we know, is someone who traveled with Paul but also traveled to places like Jerusalem and then through the rest of the Roman Empire with Paul to interview people, which he tells us he did in the beginning of his gospel. And he mentions a couple of things to us in the first four verses. He said that there, there are various accounts of this when he's writing to Theophilus. He says there are various accounts of Jesus's life and times, but I'm going to I'm going to set it out in chronological order, which tells us that the other accounts are not chronological. Um, they they again remember the illustration of the horse race. They're they're looking back on the life of Jesus and picking out the things that they think are important. They're not straightening each other's testimony out, because then then they would all be harmonized some way. Um, what they're doing is is they are they are complementing, and we'll see that as one of the one of the evidences for the reliability of the eyewitnesses. They call them undesigned coincidences, or as J.J. Blunt called it, undesigned biblical coincidences. So, um, yeah, I, I I am a self admitted nerd on this subject. Um, 
I, I confess that this is something that I would I would definitely nerd out. But we we have these we have these conditions that would only be known by people who were eyewitnesses. Um, the names of the towns are some, and we'll look at even the names of the um, of the met people mentioned in the scripture and how they're distinguished. I'll give you the outline of um, what we'll do, and this will play into, I, I, I promise you I will answer the question, did Jesus die? Um, and I know that from the Muslim, the Islamic viewpoint, um, why that's important. But we'll, we'll look at the, the manuscripts and the early testimony, um, and then the names of testimony. Hopefully we will get past that, um, but then there's what we call embarrassing testimony and corroborating testimony. These are all things that verify that these are credible. So <clears throat> when, it look, when we look at manuscripts, it depends on how we want to count the, the Greek manuscripts. As you know, the New Testament is primarily written in Greek. The first copies that came out would have come out in other languages as the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire. They would have been they would have come out in more um, uh, localized languages like Syriac or Armenian and so on and so forth. But we have the number that keeps growing by the day if you follow Dan Wallace's website. Dan Wallace is a professor from Dallas Theological Seminary, and uh, he gives us. Um, a number of things that um, help us understand the manuscript. He has a whole ministry on, on keeping the manuscripts digitized. But it, the last number that I had was 5,873, I believe it was, or somewhere in there. Some people say that it's lower than that because some of these manuscripts are, are just um, pieces. They're just uh, small, small fragments that are really part of another book. So the lowest you would get of Greek manuscripts is somewhere around uh, 5,300, something like that. If you put some of these manuscripts together, in other words, you would have like a piece of John's gospel that would be dated to the same as another part of John's gospel. And instead of counting them as two different documents, they become, they, they call them one document. Well, what do we say about these? Well, there are three major families from three different areas around the Roman Empire. And what we see about them is that, that if we line them up together, uh, we would find out that, that even the atheist, who is a New Testament scholar, would say that they are 98.5% um, correct or can, can the right word, not conducive to each other, but they are, they are consistent, that the translation is consistent, that variations, while they might be many, the variations are spelling, the majority of them are spelling, something like 70% of them are spelling changes. Uh, why is that? Well, I don't think you could go back to the first century or, or any of the centuries following that and find a dictionary that would show you proper spelling for different things. There are something like six different ways just to spell the name John. Um, <clears throat> besides that, there is the positioning of how words are said in Greek. Um, it is not subject, verb, object as it is in English. That we, we say he threw the ball. Um, in Greek, you could have them in any order at all, and it's because of their their suffix, the ending of the word, that would tell you what this sentence mean means. It could be ball could be first, he could be second, and um, through could be third. But it's the ending that tells you where it is. So in some of those places, those words are changed differently. Um, so the variations are not there, but the manuscripts are consistent, and we could see that that their consistency gives us about 90, 98 to 99 percent accurate. There's a couple of places that 
would affect, um, in some ways affect, one of them is the ending of Mark's gospel, the last uh, eight or nine verses from verse nine, I believe, to 16, is not in the earliest manuscripts. And the other one is the woman caught in adultery in John chapter eight, that that is first recognized or found in Luke's gospel, if we were to do textual criticism. But when the language was um, recognized, they, they saw it as something that um, belonged in John's gospel. And uh, you'll see how somehow how the, the New Testament is put together, how it is orchestrated to get what we have today. Uh, it isn't until recently that we that there is anything that looks like like a book that we call the Bible. Um, for many years, they were just scrolls or le lectionaries, which were certain passages put together that they would read in, in church on particular occasions. So the manuscript evidence is that we have more manuscripts um, just in Greek to all the other ancient writings in on record. I think the largest collection we have today uh, has changed considerably in the last 10 to 15 years, and that is Homer's Iliad. They have about 1,800 copies of it with only about 80% consistency. Um, that's, the, that's the most, the average Greek writing from anywhere from the first century backwards or forwards is about 20 manuscripts. Um, we, have, we have nearly, well, if we go with the lower number, 5,300 in Greek. We have another 10,000 in Latin that come from the second century onward. Uh, and then you have the minor or the other um, languages like Syriac and so on. We have a compilation of about 25,000 manuscripts that can be compared to one another and um, still come out with a, with a uh, consistency or reliability of conveying the, the message that we want to within 98 to 99% accurate. Even Bart Ehrman, who is the leading um, agnostic slash atheist scholar of the New Testament, tells us that there is nothing in the variants in the New Testament Greek, original Greek writings that would anyway distort the message of the Bible, especially the New Testament. Um, so we have an incredible amount of evidence that talks about the reliability of, of the New Testament. 